everything seems to be rolling except for audio okay now it's working chapter 18 at the graves portals there's an actual asterisk on the word portals uh, the title in this case the first title asterisk we've seen the first words of a stanza from one of Alexander Pushkin's poems, which goes on, quote, dot, 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 unrepinning, slash, may young life play, and where I lie, may heedless nature still be shining, slash, with beauty that shall never die. A bicycle, a wheel, once rolling, retains its balance only for so long as it moves. Without movement, it collapses. In the same way, the game between woman and man, once begun, can exist so long as it develops. If today didn't continue yesterday's progress, the game would no longer exist. Oleg could hardly wait for Tuesday evening, when Zoya was due to come on night duty. The gay multicolored wheel of their game had to roll a little further than it had the first night, and on Sunday afternoon. He felt within himself an urge to roll it on and foresaw the same urge in her. Nervously, he waited for her. At first he went outside, in the hope of meeting her in the garden. He knew the slanting path she always came in by. He smoked two shag cigarettes he'd rolled himself before it occurred to him that he'd look silly in his women's dressing gown. Not at all how he wanted to present himself. It was getting dark, too. He went back into the wing, took off his dressing gown and boots, and stood by the bottom of the stairs in his pajamas, looking no less absurd than he had in the dressing gown. His hair, which usually stuck up on end, was as tamed today as it ever could be. She came out of the doctor's dressing room, late and in a hurry. But she raised her eyebrows when she saw him, not in surprise, but as if noting that things were as they should be, that she'd expected him to be there, that his place was there at the foot of the stairs. She did not stop, not wishing to be left behind. He walked beside her, stretching his long legs up the staircase, two steps at a time. He could move like that without difficulty now. Well, what's new? She asked him as she climbed, as if he were her aide de camp. What was new? The changes in the Supreme Court were new all right. But she would need years of education to understand that, and it wasn't that kind of understanding that Zoya needed at the moment. I've found a new name for you. At least, I've realized what your name ought to be. Really? What? She continued, briskly up the stairs. I can't tell you while you're walking. It's too important. They were at the top now. He lagged back on the last few steps, and looking at her from behind, noted that her legs were a bit thick and heavy, although they seemed to go well with her compact figure. Still, they had a charm of their own, though light and springy legs, like Vega's, put you in a better mood. He was surprised at himself. He never used to think or look at things that way before. He found it coarse and vulgar. He would never flitted from woman to woman. His grandfather would have called it skirt mad. Still, as the saying went, Eat when you're hungry, love when you're young. Oleg had missed out in his youth, though. Now he was like an autumn plant in haste to extract the last juices from the earth so as not to regret the lost summer. During his short return to life, and his life was already going downhill, yes, downhill, he was impatient to see women and absorb them in a way which he could never mention to them. He was more sensitive than others to their nature, since 
For years, he hadn't seen one, been near one, or heard a woman's voice. He had forgotten what it sounded like. Zoya took over the shift, and it was as if she'd started whirling, like a top. She whirled around her table, around the treatment list and the medicine cabinet. Then she'd suddenly spin off sideways toward one of the doors, just like a top. Oleg watched her, and as soon as he saw that she had a moment to herself, was at her side. So there's nothing else new in the clinic asked Zoya in her delicious voice. Meanwhile, sterilizing syringes on an elastic stove and opening ampoules. Oh, there was a great event today at the clinic. Nizamutin Baromovich himself made his rounds. Did he? That's good. I'm glad I wasn't there. So what happened? Did he take away your boots? No, it wasn't the boots, but there was a bit of a clash. What happened? Oh, it was a grand occasion. Fifteen white coats walked into the ward all at once. Heads of departments, registrars, interns, doctors I've never even seen before. The senior doctor pounced on the bedside tables like a tiger. But we'd already had reports from our secret agents. We'd done a little preparation, so there was nothing for him to get his teeth into. He frowned and looked very dissatisfied. At that moment, they brought up my case, and Ludmila Afonsievna made a bit of a gaffe. She was reading out my file. What file? I mean, my case history. I always make these mistakes. She mentioned my first diagnosis and where it had been made, and it came out... I was from Kazakhstan. What? said Nizamutin. He's from another republic. We haven't enough beds. Why should we treat foreigners? Discharge him at once. But half the patients in the ward are foreigners. I know, but he just happened to pick on me. You should have seen Ludmila Afonsievna. I was amazed. She stuck up for me like a real old mother hen. Her feathers got quite ruffled. Scientifically, it's an important and complicated case, she said. We need him for fundamental conclusions. It was an idiotic situation for me to be in. A few days ago, I argued with her myself and demanded to be discharged, and she screamed at me. But now she's sticking up for me. All I had to do was say yes to Nismutin, and by lunchtime, you wouldn't have seen me for dust. I'd never have seen you again, either. So, it was all because of me you didn't say yes? Well, what do you think? Kostogatov's voice was muffled. You hadn't even left me your address. How would I have been able to look for you? But she was busy with something, so he couldn't tell how seriously she had taken him. I couldn't possibly have let Ludmila Afonsievna down, he continued, raising his voice again. I was sitting there like a log, saying nothing, while Nizamutin went on. I can go into outpatients now, and five men as ill as he is, all of them ours. Discharge him. And I suppose it was then I behaved like a fool, missing a wonderful chance of getting away. I was sorry for Ludmila Afonsievna. She blinked as if she had been hit and didn't say another word. So I leaned forward with my elbows against my knees, cleared my delicate little throat, and asked him quietly, How can you think of discharging me? I'm from the Virgin Lands. Oh, you're a Virgin Lander, really, said Nizamutin. He was afraid he'd made a bad political blunder. There's nothing our country won't do for the Virgin Lands. And they all moved on to the next bed. You're a crafty one, said Zoya, shaking her head. I never used to be, Zoya. It was the camps. They made me as sharp as an axe. There are plenty of traits in my character that aren't really me, that come from the camps. What about your cheerfulness? 
You didn't acquire that in the camps, did you? Why not? I'm used to losing everything. It always strikes me as strange when people here cry during visiting time. What are they crying about? No one's sending them into exile or confiscating their belongings. So you'll be staying with us a month or so. God forbid. But I may be here a couple of weeks. It looks as if I've given Ludmila Afonsievna a blank check. I'll have to put up with anything now. The hypodermic syringe was full of warm liquid, and Zoya shot off. She was faced with an awkward problem today and didn't know what to do. She had to give Oleg his new injection. In the usual place, the part of the body that has to put up with every indignity. But the mood that he had set in between them made the injection impossible now. It would have wrecked the game. Zoya did not want to spoil the game or the mood, neither did Oleg. The wheel would have to roll some way, yet before she was close enough to him to inject him with easy familiarity. She came back to the table, and while she was preparing one of the new injections for Amajdan, asked him, What about you? Have you come round to the idea of injections? You are not kicking against them anymore. What a question to ask a patient, especially Kostoglatov. He was just waiting for an opportunity to explain his views. You know what I think, Zoyanka? If possible, I always prefer to avoid them. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. With Turgeon, it's fine. His one ambition is to learn how to play chess. We've made a pact. If I win, no injection. If he wins, injection. The trouble is that when we play, I give him odds of a rook. But you can't swing that one with Maria. When she comes up with the syringe, her face looks like a block of wood. Sometimes I try to joke with her, but it's always patient Kostoglatov. Time for your injection. Turn back your pajamas. She never says a single kind of unnecessary word. She hates you. Me. All of you men. Well, perhaps we deserve it. Generally speaking, now there's a new nurse with whom I can't make any headway either. And when Olympiada comes back, it'll be even worse. She doesn't give an inch. That's how I'm going to be too, said Zoya, carefully measuring out two cubic centimeters. But she didn't make it sound very forceful. Off she went to inject Majin, leaving Oleg alone by the table again. There was another and more important reason why Zoya did not want Oleg to have injections. Ever since Sunday, she had been wondering whether she should tell him what they would do to him. Supposing something serious suddenly emerged from their banter, it was perfectly possible. What if this time it didn't all end in a depressing search for articles of clothing scattered around a room? What if it developed into something strong and lasting? If Zoya decided to become his teddy bear and go with him into exile? And he was right, of course. Who knows in what back of beyond happiness may be waiting. If this happened, the injections prescribed for Oleg would affect not only him, but her too. And she was against them. Well, she said gaily, returning with an empty syringe, have you plucked up your courage? Go to the ward. Turn back your pajamas, patient Kostoglatov. I'll be with you in a minute. He sat there and gazed at her with his eyes that were not the eyes of a patient. He wasn't even thinking about the injection. They had already made a pact. He looked at her eyes, which bulged slightly, asking to be freed from their sockets. Let's go somewhere, Zoya. It was more like a low rumble than speech. The more muffled his voice became, the more hers rang out. Where? Surprised, she laughed. Into town? The doctor's room. She absorbed his relentless glance. There was no game in her voice as she said, I can't, Oleg, I've got too much work. It was as if he understood her. Let's go, he repeated. Oh, 
Yes, she remembered something. I have to fill out an oxygen balloon for... She nodded toward the stairs. She may have mentioned the name of the patient, but he didn't hear. The trouble is the oxygen cylinder taps so hard to turn. You can help me. Come on. She marched down the stairs to the lower landing with him at her heels. That pitiful, yellow-looking patient with the pinched nose who was being eaten away with cancer of the lungs sat in bed, panting as he breathed through his balloon. You could hear the wheezing in his chest. Had he always been as small as that, or was it the disease that had shriveled him? He was in such a bad way that the doctors on their rounds no longer talked to him or asked him questions. He'd always been in a bad way, but today he was much worse. Even an inexperienced eye could see that. He was just finishing one balloon, and another, already empty, was lying beside him. He was in such a bad way that he didn't even notice people, whether they came up to him or just passed by. They took the empty balloon from his bedside and went on down the stairs. What treatment are you giving him? We're not. He's an inoperable case, and irradiation didn't help. Can't you open the thorax? They don't do that here yet. Not in this town. So he'll die. She nodded. And although the balloon in her hands was needed for the sick man to prevent him from suffocating, they'd already forgotten about him. They were on the verge of something quite out of the ordinary. The tall oxygen cylinder was standing in a separate corridor, which was now locked. It was here, next to the X-ray rooms, that Gangart had once found a soaking wet and dying Kostoglatov some place to sleep when they first met. Once was only three weeks ago. As long as the second corridor light was not on, and they'd only switched on the first, the corner where the wall jutted out and the cylinder stood would be in half darkness. Zoya was shorter than the cylinder, Oleg taller. She began to fit the valve of the balloon to the valve of the cylinder. He stood behind her, breathing in the scent of her hair, which was straying from under her cap. This is the tap that's stiff, she complained. He grasped the tap and managed to turn it on at once. The oxygen started to flow. There was a gentle hissing sound. Then, without any pretext at all, Oleg's hand, the one he just used on the tap, grasped Zoya's wrist the one that wasn't holding the oxygen balloon. She didn't start. She wasn't surprised. She just watched the balloon inflate. Gripping her arm, his hand slid upward, over the wrist and higher to the forearm, then beyond the elbow toward her shoulder. It was an unsubtle reconnaissance, but necessary for them both. It was a test to see whether they had interpreted each other's words rightly. They had. He ruffled her hair with two fingers. She did not protest or recoil. She went on watching the balloon. He grasped her strongly around the shoulders, tilting her whole body toward him, finally reaching her lips, the lips that had smiled at him so often, lips that never stopped chattering. As they met his, Zoya's lips were not open, soft or slack. They were taut, ready and eager, as he realized in a single flash. A moment before, he hadn't remembered, he'd forgotten that all lips are not the same, that kisses can be different, that one can be worth a hundred others. It began as a peck, then prolonged itself as they clung to each other, merging Nothing in the world could end it, and there was no need for it to end. They could have stayed like that forever, their lips crushed together. But after a time, after two centuries, their lips tore apart, and Oleg saw Zoya for the first time and heard her say, Why do you shut your eyes when you kiss? Had he shut his eyes? 
He had no idea. He hadn't noticed. Were you trying to imagine someone else? Who else? He couldn't remember anyone. As a driver snatches a quick breath and plunges back to find a pearl lurking on the ocean bed, they kissed again. But this time, he noticed that he'd shut his eyes and he opened them. Close. Unbelievably close. He saw two tawny eyes, almost predatory looking, and each of his eyes looked separately into hers. She was kissing with those confidently taut, experienced lips, never letting them go loose, rocking slightly on her feet and gazing at him steadily, as though to judge from his eyes how eternity would sentence him. Suddenly her eyes swiveled sideways. She tore herself away abruptly from him and shouted, The tap! My God, the tap! His hand shot out to it and hurriedly turned it off. By a miracle, the balloon did not burst. You see what happens with kisses? said Zoya. She had not yet got her breath back. She spoke jerkily. Her hair was disheveled, her cap askew. Of course, she was perfectly right. Nevertheless, their mouths joined again. They wanted to drain each other dry. The corridor had a glass door. Through it, someone coming around the corner might easily have seen their raised elbows, hers white, his ruddy. But who cared? When Oleg had finally got some breath back into his lungs, he scrutinized her, holding her by the nape of her neck, and said, Goldilocks, that's your real name, Goldilocks. She repeated the word, shaping her lips to it. Goldilocks? Pair of socks? All right, why not? It doesn't worry you that I'm in exile? I'm a criminal. No, she said, shaking her head frivolously. Or that I'm old? Old? Or that I'm ill? She said, she laid her forehead against his chest and stood quietly. He pulled her toward him, closer and closer, wondering again whether or not the heavy ruler on her table would slide off those warm, curving little shelves or not. Seriously, you will come to Ushterek, won't you? We'll get married. We'll build ourselves a little house. Wait, what? I hope he didn't just say that. He pulled her toward him, closer and closer, wondering again whether or not the heavy ruler on her table would slide off those warm, curving little shelves or not. Seriously? You will come to Ushterek, won't you? We'll get married. We'll build ourselves a little house. It looked as if he were going to give her the continuity, which she had never had before and which was part of her teddy bear side, the creative stability which sets in after the dazed moment when clothes were scattered around the room. She was pressed close to him. She could feel him with her womb and was trying to guess, will it come from him? Is he really the one? She reached up and cradled his neck with her elbow to embrace him again. Oleg, darling, she said, you know what these injections are supposed to do? No, what? He said, rubbing his cheek against hers. They, how can I explain? Their scientific name is hormone therapy. They're used in reverse. They give women male hormones and men female hormones. They reckon it stops the formation of secondaries. But first of all, it suppresses... Do you understand? What's that? No, not completely. His voice had changed. It sounded alarmed and jagged. He was holding her by the shoulders, differently now, as though trying to shake the truth out of her. Come on, tell me, tell me. They completely suppress sexual potency. That's the first thing that happens even before feminization or viralization. With large doses, women start to grow beards and men develop breasts. Wait a minute. What's all this? Oleg roared. 
He was only just beginning to understand. You mean these injections? The ones they're giving me now? What happens? Do they suppress everything? Well, not everything. The libido lasts quite a bit longer. How do you mean, the libido? She looked at him, straight in the eyes, and ruffled his forelock. Well, it's what you're feeling for me now, desire. So the desire stays, but the ability doesn't. Is that right? He was completely stunned. The ability becomes progressively weaker, and then the desire goes too. Do you understand? She ran her finger along his scar and stroked his cheek, clean shaven that morning. That's why I don't want you to have the injections. This is fantastic! He recovered and drew himself up to his full height. This is really fantastic! I felt it in my bones. I thought they'd try some dirty trick or other, and they have! He wanted to curse these doctors, swear at them, all obscenely for the arbitrary way they disposed of other people's lives, when suddenly he remembered Gengart's radiantly confident face yesterday. When she'd been so warm and friendly to him, when she'd looked at him and said, they're absolutely necessary, your life depends on them, we're trying to save your life. So much for Vega. She wanted to do the best for him, did she? So that was why she was trying to lure him toward his fate. That's how you're going to be, isn't it? He swiveled his eyes toward her. No, really. Why should he blame her? She saw his life as he did. She understood that life wasn't worth living without... With her avid flame-colored lips, she had just dragged him along the top of the Caucasus. There she stood. There were her lips, and as long as this libido flowed in his legs and his loins, he had to kiss her, and the sooner the better. Can't you inject me with something that'll have the opposite effect? They'd throw me out if I did, but aren't there injections that would do that? Yes, the same sort of hormone injections, but hormones of the same sex. Goldilocks, listen, let's go somewhere. We've already been somewhere. And we've arrived, and now it's time to go back. Let's go to the doctor's room, come on. No, we can't. There's an orderly there, and people are always coming and going, especially in the evening. We can wait till night. We mustn't rush things, Oleg. If we do, there won't be a... What sort of tomorrow can there be if I lose my libido tomorrow? Only that won't happen. Thanks to you, Zoya, I'll keep my libido, won't I? Now, come on. Think of something. Let's go somewhere. Oleg, darling, we must leave something for the future. Don't rush things. We have to take the balloon back. Yes, that's right. Take the balloon back. We'll take it back now. Take it back. Now. They walked up the stairs holding not hands, but the balloon, now inflated like a football. Through it, each jolt was conveyed from him to her. It was as if they were holding hands. On the landing, the yellow, shriveled patient with the weak, it had always been weak, chest was sitting up in his folding bed. Day and night, people hurried past him, sick or healthy, busy with their own affairs. Sitting among his pillows, traces of a neat part still left. He had stopped coughing and was beating his forehead against his raised knees as if they were a wall. He was still alive, but there were no living men around him. Today might be the day he was going to die. Oleg's brother and neighbor, abandoned and hungry for sympathy. Perhaps if Oleg sat by his bed and spent the night there, he could provide some solace for his last hours. All they did was give him the oxygen balloon and walk on. Those last few cubic centimeters of air in the doomed man's balloon had been no more than a pretext for going off into a corner together and getting to know each other's kisses. Like a chained man, Oleg followed Zoya up the stairs. 
he wasn't thinking about the doomed man he'd left. He'd been one himself two weeks ago, and in six months' time, he might be one again. He was thinking about this girl, this woman, this bit of skirt, and how to persuade her to go off with him again that night. He had forgotten what it was like, and so it was all the more unexpected to feel that aching sensation again, to feel lips crushed till they were rough and swollen like kisses. It made his whole body young. And that concludes chapter 18. Gee, that was the best chapter of the book so far. A very G-rated, romantic chapter. I guess you could say PG. Um, bombshell. Uh, she was giving him female hormones to cure his cancer. Is that nuts or what? Wow. The things they used to think would save people. Amazing. I feel... I mean, if... I'm thinking, so this is a semi-autobiographical novel, but I'm almost positive that this is... I mean, you don't make something like this up. You can tell Kostolgatov is Alexander Solzhenitsyn here. Very descript. Well, thank you for tuning in. Uh, Twitch.tv slash the Carter Banks Hour is now the thing. Follow me on Twitter at Carter Banks to get the notifications for the Periscope link. Can't think of anything else right now, but thanks for tuning in. Stay safe and have a great weekend.